by asking or trying to summarize this, that would be ludicrous from my side. I will open up questions. We have only 10 minutes. So really three, let's say four smart ones. Really <laughs> smart ones, okay? Robert Adam is one. I saw Doug was the second hand. Um, three, four, and five. Okay. I'm going to say where because I'm going to ask something that actually brings together both Saskia and Richard's comments. This is partly based on a research that we've done and it relates to the UK, which I think is relevant as London is sort of one of the worst examples that I build for oligarchs as well as for um, uh, urban extensions. You know, I'm a sinner and a, and a, and a good boy too. But the, um, uh, the interesting aspect of what's happening in London is that the, the uh, your description is absolutely correct, but, but its, its rebound effect is quite interesting. This is also tied up with digital working is that it's having a positive effect on tertiary towns which were declining. Is that the, the commuting distances have gone down, but the distances traveled have gone up. People are working not full weeks um, uh, in, in places in which they come to meet and centralize. They're working much more at home. This has actually, actually allowed people to actually um, revitalize towns which were seriously declining. That is a good point. And the, 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 the next point on this one, this goes to what Richard is saying, is that we did a thing called Tomorrow's Home when we invested the 18 to 34 age cohort. Um, and the other thing that's happening in any event is that the, the boundary between work and home is dissolving anyway. That's currently happening. I mean, legislation will, and regulation will have to catch up with that, but that is actually happening because the, the split between the home and work is actually a post-industrial revolution phenomenon. So this kind of informality uh, is actually happening, whether, you know, whether we want it to or not. It simply is partly a product of, of, of digital working. I, I think he said it all. I mean, uh, you know, I, 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 since there's not a lot of time, but I, I sort of agree with, with what, what your comments were, and right? I mean, do you want, did you ask me something that I have to, no. No, I think that, that, no, 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 really, I'm just glad that you elaborated on those two points. And since there were so many other questions, maybe we can return at the end, but you know. Sure. Yeah. But I think it was Doug. Yeah, well. <clears throat> I guess this is more to Richard. Um, many of us have challenged and questioned the Charter of, Adams, of Athens for a long time. It's certainly been on the table, the chopping block for many groups. Um, so, it's, Great that you're also taking it on. Um, anytime these big paradigms are questioned, the tendency historically seems to be a sort of extreme reaction where you go in the opposite direction on every facet. And in a perverse way, are sort of enslaved by the previous paradigm. In other words, what they posit, you posit the opposite. And I'm worried that if you succeed, we'll have overly porous, overly open, overly incomplete <laughs> cities. Now, I realize you're up against a huge inertia, a huge amount of inertia, and perhaps you see yourself just as pushing back against it and hoping to make progress. But why not go for balance, for something in the middle, rather than just setting the pendulum swinging once again in a direction that will anticipate another swing back in the future? No. No. Okay, let me. You know, you know, no, but I want to, while you're, while you're reacting. Mediocrity. Uh, or reacting. You know, I mean, just my observation is that we now have so many mega projects in our cities that the balance that you talk about, which is not an unreasonable thing to say, frankly, I would agree with you, is precisely that other part, you know, and to make that a central part of a city. Because more and more, I mean, central Manhattan now, it's all corporate high-rise buildings and luxury apartment buildings. We have only those kinds of, and London is going that way as well, and so are a bunch of other cities. Rwanda is going that way now. You know, I mean, no, no matter where you look in the world. So I think that you're right about the balance. I don't think we can just go, it cannot all be, you know. But at the same time, what we need now is the counterbalance to that mega closed, and sort of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, one thing that, that has really uh, uh, struck me, I, I work a lot with uh, Chinese uh, planners and architects uh, 
through various human projects. And these are people who are full of regret because they built a lot very fast in a very closed way and now it's not working. And the cities are very, many of them, parts of them have become dysfunctional ghost towns. Other parts of them are developing problems the Chinese never thought they'd have, like neglect of the aged by their children who are living in a different, different uh, kind of physical configuration. So, you know, the pressure that what, what uh, that generation of 20th century called rational has become rationalized. And it's, it's really the dominant mode of the way we build. It's the same problem with smart cities, which um, it's an abused technology, which is used more and more prescriptively, um, uh, with less and less choice for people, and so on. Right, my, my point is simply this. Uh, I think you're, you're making a professorial point. <laughs> oh, God Not forbid, said. as if we didn't. Ooh, <laughs> I couldn't resist that one. <laughs> Thank you, please. Thank you, Professor Sennett. <laughs> Uh, hello, my name is Nelson, I'm an architect. Um, I would like to, to, uh, to ask something to uh, Richard. Uh, one of the outcomes of the 1976 Habitat Conference, actually the first Habitat Conference in Vancouver, was uh, this idea of this model, the figure of sites and services. Curiously enough, let's say sites and services was championed by the World Bank, for instance, and actually for, say, uh, decades, they actually delivered, let's say, millions of, of new homes, right? So to a certain extent, that notion of sites and services had already embedded these three qualities that you mentioned, right? So some kind of openness, informality, uh, you know, because you could just, you know, set up basic infrastructural core, and then you could just give people self-help uh, uh, initiatives, let's say, to bring this thing forward. So my question is, uh, when you bring this thing up again, is it some kind of nostalgic uh, uh, attempt to go back 40 years to the, the outcome of the first Habitat conference, or have you learned something about it, and are you now <laughs> trying to improve it, and if so, how? Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, it's a wonderful question. Yeah. Does it work? Yeah. yeah. This is a wonderful question. Yes, I, I, I suffer from nostalgia. I was at that conference. <laughs> <laughs> I had hair at the, you know, I mean, so. I think what this is trying to do, uh, to deal with, is uh, that what makes a difference is the time dimension. In it. Because the idea here is to, to find ways of building which are more flexible in time than we thought of in 76. And I think we were still then under the notion is that we, developed, we delivered a package which worked, you know, which was self-sufficient. Uh, uh, um, so, uh, you know, I would say it's, a, it's not a break with 76, but it is, it, it is a putting in uh, this element of incompleteness is a different way, and it's very difficult for bankers. How can I invest in something I don't, I don't know what I'm getting? How can I put money into DNA? But still, the World Bank uh, sponsored a lot of science and services projects in India, in Africa, and South America. So what, if it worked back then, why uh, do you think that it was gonna, not going to work now? Well, one of the reasons it's not working are the kinds of issues that Saskia is bringing up. Yes, 30 years of history. Uh, I, I'm actually talking to two mics. I don't know if you can hear anything that way, but <laughs> you can have that mic. No, but I think that is what we are leaving out. But two things. One, the World Bank. There are a lot of great people at the World Bank. It's often the leadership who tends to sort of mess it out a bit. But, but, um, but the, the fact is that we have rebuilt our cities. You know, there is much more corporate act. I will use that as shorthand. So I think there is need. Now, I want to come back to Robert Adams a bit about 
that one effect has been to reoccupy, if you want, all the cities that have been run down. And then maybe you have a different kind of built environment. But in our main city, and in sort of our big cities, you have a lot of, so porosity needs to be recovered. I mean, that is what, you know, that is the difference, I would say, with 40 years ago and today. But let's get more questions. There's the gentleman in the yellow. Sorry that I don't know your name. Yeah. We'll go to six more minutes. And yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Ismael Fernandez. Good to know. Uh, I'm, I'm living in Mexico City, and uh, it seems that uh, the position that you're taking goes back to the 70s again. Uh, the size of the city, uh, when you're living there, uh, organizes in a way in which you really live in a certain section of it. You don't cross all the city around because there's a lot of traffic and a lot of uh, time wasted. And that means that you have a, a, a macro view of the city when you look from the uh, satellites. And the other one is when you're living in, you have a <coughs> micro view of the city itself. So that brings me to the situation that you were describing about the, uh, how to build in an MIT matter. Uh, it seems to me that in the 70s, uh, Christopher Alexander, when uh, he wrote that book that uh, the city is not free, was looking for something like that in the sense of the juxtaposition of the life itself in cities. So the point that you're making is that uh, look at the trends and uh, build infrastructure to the trends and then let the people decide of uh, their own uh, micro city systems to work together or how is that uh, you are proposing this situation and again uh, if uh, that's a difference how is going to legally be uh, uh, tackled the, the, the possibility of doing that situation? Well this is, uh, uh, this is a very good question uh, or a set of questions. Uh, I personally have been very influenced by Christopher Alexander I think he's, he, he's a, a much neglected, very important figure. Uh, again, your two questions are related because the size of cities that they're talking about was something on a scale that we can't imagine today. It's true that density doesn't make a city, but the problem of a mega city, of, of you know, 26 million people, perhaps, in Mexico City, who knows, we can't, we can't count, means that the city uh, has a totally different configuration than uh, it would have meant for them. They could think of a systems approach which took it all into place. What we are saying is that the size is so great that to unify a city of uh, 26 million or 37 million, which is Tokyo, is fruitless. That there are actually many cities contained within, and the point is to find out what those cities are rather than see them as coordinated into one whole. And this translates into, into very practical things like building airports, uh, how you distribute electricity grids and so on, you know, hier hierarchies of distributing electricity and so on. But um, I think that, you know, with both of these, we're in a different, it's not that the 70s were, you know, got it all, you know, that it's all past and we have to turn a big page. But we're dealing with a kind of urban structure which requires thinking much more nodally because of the size of the, aggregates we're dealing we can't think in a totalized way about the city today or at least that's my view one micro question because i need to wrap it up uh, my name is oh, well, i'm from ecuador so it would be very nice if you next year there and also an architect and urban planner my question is that hearing you both exp uh, expositions you took, i i thought that the that the data and the quality or quantity and the quality aspects are now in the eye of the storm because with all the topics about right of the city, right of, of public space, it's have both uh, subjects, the quality and quantity. So what do you think about these kind of topics in uh, integrities? Uh, yes, I've always wanted to ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the eye of the storm, can you, 
what storm? Because I, I am seeing many storms, you know what I mean? So there is not one eye. You know, I mean, there is this corporate investment bit. There is the loss of habitat for more and more people. You know, so, and then, you know, how do we handle it? Huh? Look at these 7,000 floating in boats on the Andaman Sea, you know, of Thailand, etc. I mean, so when you say I, so I want to, I know the right to the city and all of that, I understood that part, but what I, what is the I for you of the storm? Uh, for me, yes. is the one that begins in the 90s is with the neoliberal model of the city. Okay, fine, fine. Well, so I, I alluded to, you know, this, the, I really think we are in a growing zone that starts maybe in the West, but is also spreading to China. <laughs> you know, uh, we are operating under new systemics, which are marked by extraordinary divergence, rather than this trend towards you know a certain direction that you see after World War II in the West. You know, we industrialize, we blah blah blah. Now we are we are moving in two different directions, and so for me, the city is one critical space where those without power can contest that, you see. There are not many ways of engaging power today. Power has become very remote, very intermediated. So the city is one place, it's one moment in multiple power circuits where, you know, as we say in, I grew up in Buenos Aires, estamos presentes. State, we're not asking you for something. We're telling you that we are here. The city is that space. Uh, a, a plantation is not. It was at one point. There were plantations that were that possibility, where you had a mass of people in a way that in that distributed zone in the 1800s, the plantation was a space where they could all come together and confront, right? Not today. Today these are militarized, etc. So, So that is why I care so much about recovering a kind of city that has multiple things including some of the elements that you were mentioning, you know, that are also, or that Julian was alluding to indirectly, not with this in mind necessarily, people are makers. And the city is a space where we can be makers. I don't mean makers as in the new movement of makers. I don't know what that is about. Eh? But, uh, but they basically do 3D printing. That, that's the kind of making. But, um, so so we, must, we must interrogate what we mean by the city, we must interpolate that concept. We right. cannot just simply say, oh, the city is the city. So for instance, in my research, if I went, well, I'm really a political economist, you may have understood, I'm not a thoroughbred urbanist like my dear husband is. <laughs> yeah, really, an urbanist. But so, so I, when I'm doing my research, I have to remove myself sufficiently from the city that I have to find my way back to what is the city. So when people just talk like the city is this sort of the city is the city, you know, I, I really think we are we are in another period. Eh? That is what I'm. I, I would uh, respond to your question very simply and shortly. That the relationship between quantity and quality is this is the holy grail of what I think we need to be doing now. And you know, one of the paradoxical effects of the old charter of Athens was to deny that that was a question because it had rationalized form. And it is a, uh, I'm writing a book about this now, this, uh, the relation between making and dwelling is asymmetric. Form, you know, quantity and quality don't fit together easily. And I think it's a kind of holy grail to see that, you know, there are many ways in which people dwell, for instance, which are very dysfunctional. I, again, when I saw this list up on here, you know, I, I don't think we as architects and planners should be helping to build gated communities. We should refuse. That's a bad way to live. You know? But, you know, that's where you get this, it's an asymmetric relationship. So, you know, I think you put your, 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 you put your hand on something terribly, terribly important. From Quito. Yeah. From Quito. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Before I let you, I, I need to say something myself too. No. 
fantastic. And I, I want you to take something from this. Uh, I think what you, you, you have this tendency or you have this uh, uh, gift to predict the trends even before they reach us. And they're big global trends. We can, might be talking about very, very important things, but there's things out of our control happening that we need to take care of and think about. And also what you talked about, the open system, uh, all the wonderful things that are being done in this room and elsewhere from the Congress of New Urbanism, from do-it-yourself practices, from Project for Public Spaces, from Slum Dwellers Association, they can all find their place in the open system because it's not a closed system. So all good ideas have equal standing. I think that's what Robert Strunk said once in Yale. And uh, I think I would want to end it with that. And I would like you to give a tremendously warm applause, round of applause for you.